I, it's an extraordinary privilege, actually, this afternoon to introduce three of the great heavyweights of our subject, um, starting with Florian Kroll. Um, and I hope, Florian, you won't find it offensive if I say that if you look on the website, in the first place, you're very, very reticent about the biography, but in the second place, it looks as if you published one book, per, you have been publishing one book per year since unification. Um, and it's, 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 it's an extraordinarily um, productive um, bibliography, and a lot of it is absolutely central um, to what we are doing today. A lot of it is concerned with Jews, with the images of Jews, with what Jews write, with the conditions of Judaism and so on. Um, so it is wonderful to have you um, here to talk to us, and please do. I have an exceedingly boring biography. <laughs> I've been in the same institute for 25 years. But uh, unification coincided with my emigration, <laughs> which I held in great esteem biographically. <laughs> now, uh, when I was asked to participate in uh, uh, this uh, event, I first looked at Augusta Horschner, uh, because uh, you concentrated on the two Prague and Berlin <coughs> novels, and simply judging from the titles, I thought in uh, uh, Hoffman's prolific uh, later work, surely there must be something in that, and there isn't. Mm -hmm. Even uh, uh, a cycle of sketches uh, called Frau unter sich, or, uh, there is not a Jew Jewess in sight, and not, no thematization of much modernity. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I thought uh, Gertrud Kolmer quite neatly fits into uh, the scope of thematics and uh, also chronological uh, scope of uh, this uh, venture. Now, while her uh, lyric uh, attracts most critical attention and uh, her plays uh, also begin to receive some attention, her two prose works have received some recognition as complex works of art, but the two prose pieces have not been studied as interlinked uh, and one responding to the other, i.e. as part of an ongoing conversation. Uh, while I assume that uh, a number amongst you know them, uh, indulge me in uh, reminding you what the two prose pieces by Kolmar are about. The Jüdische Mutter was written in 1930-31 and first published in 1965 as Eine Jüdische Mutter. I won't go into the controversy about the title. It tells in a third-person narrative, uh, which mostly adheres to the protagonist's perspective, the story of a Jewish woman whose daughter from a failed marriage to a Gentile falls victim to an incredibly heinous act of sexual violence. Overwhelmed by her unconscious daughter suffering as she lies in a coma in hospital, she euthanizes her. Unable to receive sufficient support from the authorities, she embarks on a quest to find the culprit herself, in the process engaging the help of a younger man who uh, later becomes her lover. The plot follows Martha, Martha Volk through a number of stages which enable Kolma to evaluate different avenues of finding answers, not only to the criminal case, but also to the existential doubts and anxieties that haunt her protagonist. Amongst these episodes are personal encounters in a social uh, gathering uh, representing uh, uh, middle-class sociability, where a conversation with the hostess sparks reflections on sexual morality, abortion, infanticide, maternal guilt, then there is a visit to a gay and transvestite bar that gives rise to considerations of sexual normality and deviation. There is a session with a clairvoyant, a visit to a synagogue, and importantly, a consultation with a lawyer that Colma uses to present an extended exchange on issues of absolute and human justice, of retribution and truth. The narrative thus conducts quite a systematic investigation into the social, religious, legal consequences and implications of a position that arises not only from the crime, but also from uh, the protagonist's uh, predicament 
uh, after the crime has been committed and her hopelessness, which in many ways is framed as representative of female Jewish condition in the circumstance of unleashed modernity. The narrative ends with her suicide after realizing that her obsessive quest has destroyed the relationship with her lover and that her blaming the rapist for the death of her daughter has obscured her own culpability. The considerably shorter novella, Susanna, was written in the winter of 1939-40, to 40, while Colma was forced to live in a so-called Judenhaus in Berlin. This text, too, was only published posthumously some 15 years after the end of the war. Here, we have a distinct narrative voice, which belongs to a governess employed by a lawyer, again, in a small eastern Prussian town to look after an unusual 20-year-old girl who is unable to function in society without guidance. When the governess inadvertently overhears the conversation between Susanna and her lover Rubin, she fails in her duty as chaperone, as it is succinctly summarized by the girl's guardian, sie verstehen, dass Susanna niemals heiraten darf. When his family shifts Rubin to Berlin to prevent the relationship, Susanna attempts to follow him there. She is killed by a train because, when her savings prove insufficient to purchase a train fare, the ticket vendor joke, jokingly advises her to walk to Berlin on the tracks. While the earlier novel frames its plot with two violent deaths, the novella culminates in one such incident. While the novel uses one focalizer to unravel the psychological and existential problematics, the novella foregrounds two mutually illuminating modes of existence personified by the two Jewish women, Susanna and the governess. Conversations and interactions between them are used to paint a picture of the young girl's state of mind, which highlights her unaffectedness by the conventions of society and by the afflictions of modernity which the governess, a single and self-reliant professional, represents. The governor's lenience towards the girl's dangerous impulse, i.e. her feelings for this man Rubin, betrays an implicit longing of the modern woman for the simplicity, innocence, wholeness and naturalness, which promises a reversal of the alienation the stifling uh, and constricting intellectual, spiritual, and social conditions governing modern civilization. Susanna might be seen to represent what the modern woman has lost. The narrator, in contrast, is characterized by an emptiness akin to that experienced by Martha Wolf, the protagonist of the novel, after the death of her daughter, maybe even before. Yet while the young girls Nature initially suggests the existence of an alternative. Her tragic death dispels all such notions. The investigation commenced in the older text is hence continued into the newer one. In both cases, the unfolding of the stories convey a sincerely fatalistic reaction to the challenges of modernity as represented by the two modern women. While the opening frame of Susanna reflects the author's own desperate situation while writing, the governess waits for an affidavit that would allow her to enter the United States and escape Nazi terror, the, initial, the internal story is set 11 years earlier, i.e. almost concurrently with the Jüdische Mutter. The two narratives can be seen to play through in an almost chiastic arrangement, different scenarios in different locations, but in pursuit of similar concerns. While the later novella is not outwardly set in a modern environment, its theme is also recognizably a modern one in that it represents search for meaning, belonging and healing in a hostile environment, which highlights uh, that uh, the urban modernity of the Jüdische Mutter is not the cause but primarily a symptom of underlying conditions. The small town, the eastern town in Susanna, imposes an existential solitude that is not categorically different from that in metropolitan Berlin. 
Modernity does not spare the backwater, because modernity is but a heightened ontological state that manifests itself everywhere in similar ways. There is broad consensus in the critical literature that Gertrud Kolmer quotation themesizes female Jewish identity. The reader is continually confronted with a specific conflicted Jewish female sexuality, writes Barbara Franz. Monika Schafi, contending that Kolmer's writing addresses alle Erfahrungen von Weiblichkeit and refuses to obey any conventions, auch im sexuellen Bereich, highlights Kolmer's Einordnung in den Text der weiblichen Moderne. The complex of sexual self-determination in both uh, pieces versus adherence to gender roles stemming from Jewish and or middle-class German traditions which are not incompatible is itself indicative of how emphatically modern issues are, uh, how emphatically modern the issues are that are at stake in Kolmar's writings. Furthermore, the setup of the two pieces, uh, namely the investigative methodology into the perils of modernity, display striking similarities. In the novel, the spiritual dislocation and intellectual exposure so characteristic of the modern condition is contained in and triggered by the crime against the child. The event and subsequent development are played out against the background and are themselves emblematic of modernity. I won't go into much detail here, but it is obviously also a Berlin novel where uh, all features of modernity from, 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 from traffic to sociability to are uh, thematized and come to uh, the fore. Uh, very, very interesting is the location on the fringes between the wasteland and canals and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the story from the protagonist's prior life through the traumatic event itself and its consequences right down to her suicide bespeak different chronological stages of a profound rupture between a before and an after, a lapse or derailment in a seemingly inevitable and consequent tra trajectory in which the generation, uh, the general socio-cultural direction, growth, urbanization, secularization, and the protagonist's personal development coincide. And this personal development culminates in uh, the marriage to a Gentile, uh, in single motherhood, in sexual self-determination when she takes her lover, and in pa paid employment as manifestation of modern gender roles. In Susanna, this rupture is constructed as a synchronous chasm between what the narrator stands for, professionalism, spiritual and social homelessness corresponding to religious Secular, secularism and the girl's unique wholeness, rootedness, uh, I don't hesitate to even call it blessedness because I think that uh, that's what uh, Kolmer wanted to convey. In both cases, the catastrophe is caused by anonymous, uncontrollable external factors. The sexual attack and the accident on the railway tracks are signifiers of the decidedly modern episteme of randomness, unpredictability, unknowability, and contingency. And they bring about a self-annihilation which seems to be the only imaginable upshot of the unsoluble ambivalences and upper years in which all involved are entangled. In both stories, relationships of guardianship between mother and child in the novel or between mentor and mentee fail without any intentional wrongdoing on the part of the protectors. Both cases involve the desecration, the spoiling of an innocence and the violation of an ideality. Uh, the girl that is murdered is only five years old and there are images of her primeval, innocent nature that are quite prevalent. In both cases, maternal lineages are broken, and through this device, 
the validity and sustainability under prevailing circumstances of any affiliations, heritages, and orientations in general becomes interrogated. In spite of the radical psychological and social realism in the Jüdische Mutter, the naming of characters betrays Kolmar's allegorical intent. The protagonist's maiden name, Jalason, places her as descendant of the people of Judah and epitome of Jewishness. Her married name, Volk, awakens associations with both the wolf, she, uh, her protective behavior towards her daughter has been described as that of a she-wolf in an older contribution on Gertrud Kolmer, uh, of both Wolf and of Cloud, uh, thus introducing the dichotomy of a protective, uncensored instinct as a natural trait and fantasy idealism or aspirationalism as uh, quintessentially human qualities. Similarly, the name Susanna associates a profoundly Jewish essence, namely the importance of the law and its upholders as guarantors of unity and integrity in the fragile state of exile, and the significance of prophecy as the articulation of the divine will, and thus the specific immediate Jewish relationship with deity. Both narratives thus advertise themselves as dealing with matters Jewish and with matters of gender. The post lapsarian state of temporality, imperfection, provisionality uh, is exacerbated by the distinctly modern perception of contingency. Fate randomly befalls the individual who no longer enjoys the comforts and the consolation of accepted belief systems. The tragedy of modernity, I see both narratives as adhering to a classical model of tragedy, uh, is that the secular, human-made orders of meaning and justice are inadequate, deficient substitutes for divine authoritative, authoritative traditional orders and that any attempts at self-empowerment have only accelerated and deepened the alienation from the former assumed oneness of the human, the divine, and the natural. I mention the natural here because that comes to the fore in the sexual themes in both stories. The Jüdische Mutter stages the process of modernization in a variety of ways, and I only want to highlight one of the threads that are pursued in uh, the narrative. For the Jewish family of the Yada zones, their relocation from a Westposensche Stadt to Berlin might be seen as emblematic of a wider Jewish movement of secularization, modernization, and urbanization away from traditional Jewish contexts. The provisional culmination of this process is Martha's uh, interreligious marriage, which, in an explicit bid to create a future, is sanctioned by her father. Yet, in line with the modernist ambivalence, it is also significant that this father dies immediately after giving his cautious blessing, without opportunity to provide any guidance or input into the future. Quote, er hat, hätte nichts dagegen, ein Glaubensgenosse wäre ihm lieber gewesen, ja, und die Volks wären reich und die Zeiten hart, und er wüsste gern sein Kind wohl versorgt vor dem Scheiden. Wohl versorgt is a legacy and it is a limp and a very worldly one without any, let's call it perspective or future. Uh, it's utilitarian, like that. The assimilation of the family, however, seems not to lead anywhere but isolation and stasis inertia in the older generation, whereas the younger generation, i.e. the protagonist herself, appears suspended and torn between the forces of old and new. Bei Sonnenwetter, Sommerwetter mochte sie auch mit den Eltern in einer Anlage hocken. Dann schritt sie wohl zum Bahnhof hinüber und schaute ein Weilchen mit seltsamen Augen zu den ein- und ausfahrenden Stadtbahnzügen empor. This stands for many, many such metaphorical thematizations of the tornness or the ambivalence of a split 
hocken and hinüberschauen, longingly, but not uh, uh, seeing any perspective in that. The Jewish attempt to join the social and cultural mainstream unfolds against uh, the background of, uh, in the text mostly latent, only sometimes manifest anti-Jewish sentiment. Martha's husband's family, especially his father, expresses skepticism about the relationship and only a sense when he perceives the Jewish family as suitably middle class. Kolma configures the sexual relationship as a microcosm of the Jewish Gentile relationship at times of transformation, i.e. a middle classification of society at large, a breaking down of former social, cultural and religious barriers in an atmosphere of meritocratic individualism and pursuit of personal happiness, including sexual fulfillment. The attitude with which both sides enact this convergence can at best be described as uncomfortable and half-hearted. Later, her boyfriend, not the husband, uh, he dies, uh, later her boyfriend makes rather stinging reference to an independence of spirit and lifestyle which in her case manifests itself not only in financial self-reliance but also in a se sexual self-determination, an active pursuit of her sexual desires which he attributes with her assent to her Jewishness. Du bist eine Dirne, sie schüttelte stumm den Kopf, du bist eine Jüdin. In this context, and later on, antisemitism is acknowledged as a prevalent social current. Antisemitism as a concrete political and cultural movement comes into stark focus when, in the lounge of the apartment where her lover has lodgings, the protagonist detects the publication of a folkish organization. Some of the slogans espoused in the magazine are cited in evocative ellipses. Der wahre Feind geht plattfüßig, dickbäuchig, krummnäsig, schwarz, tagtäglich an euch vorüber, and so on and so forth. This is the most uh, uh, concrete reference to antisemitic sentiment and agitation that stifles even the remaining prospects of some form of symbiosis. Uh, uh, sorry, I have to start again. That this most concrete reference uh, to antisemitic sentiment and agitation agitation occurs towards the end of the narrative in the context of a last attempt to rescue the relationship suggests that it forms a contributory factor in her decision to end her life, i.e. It, it epitomizes the finality of Jewish aspirations and yet antisemitism is, is exposed here not for its own sake, uh, not as a cause for the protagonist's anxieties but as a symptom of the crisis of modernity in general. So it ties in, in uh, the narrative economy of, uh, 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 of, of, of the text with uh, other motives. It's not exposed and there is no uh, 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 <coughs> cause or allocation of guilt or blame. I'm uh, quite uh, sure about that. The catastrophe uh, the narrative's main concern uh, uh, are not uh, the, the search for external uh, hostilities as explanations for the predicaments, but uh, uh, the narrative looks inward into the Jewish community uh, and into the female protagonists and characters. The catastrophe prompts Martha to attempt a reconnection with Judaism to reverse the process of estrangement from a religious ethos that she perceived uh, as lukewarm and smarmy. Uh, there is a very stinging scene, uh, not experienced by her, but related uh, through a third party, where a prediger im Ornat der Reformgemeinde sermonizes about Goethe und Schiller, Schopenhauer und Kant, and that provokes the reaction in the bystander. Er hat ganz prachtvoll gesprochen, so freisinnig, gar nicht, als ob es ein jüdischer Geistlicher wäre. Uh, this uh, lukewarmness uh, provokes uh, her uh, search to find some meaning in the predicament that had 
before in her, in her inherited religion, but this attempt uh, goes wrong. There is uh, indeed no way back into uh, uh, the folds of her religious community. Es ist nichts, es gibt mir nichts, ich gehe nicht mehr hin. Oh Gott, ach, hilf mir doch, hilf mir. Uh, uh, she's, uh, she, she pleads with uh, herself, essentially, and the answer is, es gibt keinen Gott, es gibt nichts, es ist gar nichts da, ich muss das alleine tragen. The realization that there is no reprieve from uh, uh, this helpless and exposed ontological state, no religious comfort to be found anywhere, and no social or civil framework of regulation to take the place of the forsaken certainty contained in transcendental belonging, is at the heart of the protagonist's and the author's own analysis of the modern condition. Sie kam nicht heraus, sie war nun in diese Umwelt verstoßen, und kam nicht heraus. Uh, the allusion to uh, the lapse, the expulsion, are very clear, and they are taken up in Susanna, in my opinion. When uh, the Jüdische, while the Jüdische Mutter portrayed an extreme case of existential suffering, the protagonist in the second installment of uh, this investigation seems to be designed as a direct response, the direct opposite as well. Sie leidet nicht, are the words of Susanna's, Susanna's guardian, the Justizrat Fadon, at the very outset of the story. And yet, the theme of innocence uh, 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 that is attached to Susanna, or rather the inseparability of sinless felicity and the legacy of the original sin, enters his description also, at, on the very first pages, when the Guardian mentions her love of jewelry. In diesem ist sie ein Weib. Uh, as the first conversation between the governess and her new ward revolves around the precious uh, ruby stone on the former's, the governess's brooch, brooch, how do you pronounce that? Brooch. Brooch. And as the latter's lover's name turns out to be Rubin as well, uh, color scheme or color symbolism of love, loss and violation is established uh, in which there are echoes of a similar color scheme in the Jüdische Mutter where the red denotes both blood and suffering and passion. It is a rape after all that uh, triggers uh, the action. And in both of these color schemes and of the uh, uh, value of the color red, the paradox of modernity is condensed. The girl's innocence not only clashes with the expectations and strictures of the world beyond her sanctuary, but carries its own contradictions within itself. And the joyous red of the stone meets a physicality in which sin is uneradicably inscribed. The impossibility of innocence, of belief, of healing and salvation thus permeates both narratives. The childlike nature of the young girl shows traits of schizophrenia, autism, and narcissism. According to Monica Schafi, it is psychologically best described as an inability to, to distinguish between reality and non-reality, to accept binary oppositions such as subject and object, signifier and signified, between the materiality of language, for example, and its symbolic denotary quality between here and beyond. And thus, uh, she is described not only as a mentally uh, ill person, but somebody who uh, uh, represents a state before reason and before culture. And that's what I mean with wholeness or blessedness, or whatever you might uh, want to call it. Uh, to give just some examples how that manifests itself, uh, for her, the word frying pan creates the stench of cooking, and she believes that words can disappear from books or become replaced. The literality of her worldview epitomizes the wholeness and uncorruptedness of her being, 
and it extends to other areas as well, most importantly, religion and love. Her utterances constantly speak not so much a world of fantasy as is normally put forward in secondary literature, that she lives in a fantasy uh, world, but of connectedness, harmony, uh, unity between categories uh, that civilization has separated. If the world of fantasy and imagination and also uh, the fulfillment of sexual relationship epitomize the possibility, i.e. her relationship with Rubin, the possibility to reassemble the disassembled, so does religion as inherited, unquestioned, embraced cultural and spiritual heritage. Her abandonment of the principles that organize modernity, such as linearity, order, and categorization, uh, she cites the Bible as her witness. Man muss jedes Buch von der ersten Seite anlesen, bloß die Bibel nicht. Die kann man aufschlagen, wo man will, da ist alles Anfang und Ende, weil es Gottes Wort ist. Susanna enjoys the consolation that Martha seeks. Alles Geschaffene ist Gottes. Thus celebrating man's participation in the divine in its specifically Jewish incarnation. Ich bin eine Tochter vom König David und vom König Saul. Die lebten, das ist schon lange her, aber wir haben es nicht vergessen. Aber die anderen vielen Leute stammen nicht von Königen ab, bloß ich, denn ich bin eine Jüdin. I cite these because they illustrate how they are a direct response to the former uh, story where this uh, Du bist eine Jüdin is an ascription, not contradicted, but it is an ascription and here it's embraced and it's becomes a positive value that symbolizes uh, the alternative to uh, the modern women in both stories. The unificatory impetus culminates in the scene with her lover Rubin, in the words uh, of the secret observer, und beide waren eins. Uh, there is more to that. Uh, normally, und beide waren eins uh, uh, is code for a sexual union. That doesn't take place. The innocence uh, is maintained. Uh, it is taken up uh, then by uh, Susanna herself when she simply says, ich bin glücklich. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the usual Mutter is uh, linguistically very, very elaborate. Uh, 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 here the simplicity as the alternative <coughs> symbolizes uh, this uh, vision that there might be uh, something else than the modern predicament uh, still salvageable. In the unconditionality of emotion, trust, harmony of spirit, uh, uh, and nature, she seamlessly and unquestioningly reconciles physical and spiritual attraction as she reconciles time and convention and she reverses estrangement and alienation so prevalent in post-religious culture. In a cosmos where reason, imagination and language, love in emotional and physical manifestations and social conventions have not yet drifted apart, where time, linearity, sexual morality, and other forms of stricture have not yet intruded, rules that would regulate imperfections are unnecessary. That's the discussion about civil society. Here, in the small town environment of the uh, novella, the blissful Herzenseinfalt can, however, only flourish because it is protected, uh, because its protagonist or symbol is protected. Yet the absence of any Wissen in ihre Entsetzlichkeit, meaning the horrors of the world outside, does not mean that the horrors do not exist. While the reader is almost automatically inclined to sympathize with the governess's non-interference in the blossoming relationship, the narration itself emphasizes the governess's neglect of responsibilities, her derogation of her Pflicht, this fa failure, like Martha's in not protecting her child from harm, was not deliberate or malicious. It is a consequence of the modern insecurity of existence of sustained and unsoluble guilt, inadequacy and compromise. Dagmar Lorenz, I will lay into her a little bit as well. Her contention, 
Uh, that <laughs> 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 the empire strikes back. <laughs> we strike back against the empire. <laughs> Her contention that sowohl eine jüdische Mutter wie Susanna stehen für die großen Deutschen und nicht Jüde, für die stehen in der großen deutschen und nicht jüdischen Tradition, fails to recognize Kolmas intent to imbue her narratives with elements derived from Jewish traditions, Asian as well as modern. The urban modernity in die jüdische Mutter is presented in a language and style that, on the one hand, betray a decisively modernist expressive intent aptly described as a nebeneinander von expressionistischen und neusachlichen Schreibweisen. At the same time, not incompatible with the former, it is also steeped, and I quote uh, 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 Michael Evans, steeped in the text and tone of the Old Testament. The Old Testament provides a foil and model in terms of sentiment and form, particularly evident in the contumacy of Martha's thoughts and the stern matter-of-factness of her narrative voice. Susanna, while adopting the novella format of the extraordinary event, displays traits of ghetto fiction, such as the desolateness of the barren eastern landscape, a small community populated with characteristic types such as Luftmenschen and Schlemils. Furthermore, it is imbued with the same resignative melancholy of irretrievability that characterizes 19th century ghetto fiction, or part of that genre. However, more concrete traits of traditional Jewish uh, lifestyles, of community dynamics, and uh, of any religious institutions or rituals are absent. And the small eastern town is just as hostile and anonymous as is the modernizing metropolis. And it is subject not to any kind of accepted religious regime, but to a civil order which, as far as the girls' affairs are concerned, is represented by the aforementioned Justizrat, whose appearance reminds <coughs> the writer of a Förster or a Kriegsmann, other officers of civil society. And that's the threat that's very prevalent. I, uh, I'm afraid I can't uh, go into that too much, uh, but there is the lawyer figure in the former one as well, and they have a very, very prominent role as representing that that might have the capacity to uh, replace the divine order or the, the divine belonging that is uh, absent under the conditions of modernity. The indicators are thus overwhelming that Kolmar's interest was directed towards conducting a discussion about the Jewish condition in modern society. Both families end with the present generation. It's very significant. But in neither story uh, is antisemitism blamed <coughs> for this finality. Uh, as I've said, it is a contributory factor, but it is not the sole reason why Jewish lineages terminate in these narratives. While in the 19 while well, in 1930 31, anti Semitism was an acute feature of the social and cultural landscape, and in 1939 40, the murderous nature of Nazi anti Semitism had become obvious, Kolmar explains the dissolution of Jewish history as an intra Jewish phenomenon. I take issue with uh, the prevailing secondary literature, and this might be a little bit too sharp in formulation, but I stick to it for the moment and maybe uh, I'll modify that at another stage. The predispositions that trigger the chain of events that resulted in the self-destruction is shown as Martha's and Susanna's alone. And the factors identified as responsible for these outcomes are the inability to cope with the pressures unleashed by modernity in Mutter and exposure to post-lapsarian imperfection in the case of Susanna. This is reflected in the narrator's comment in the closing frame of the novella, which is mostly not recognized as a, responding, as a response to the opening frame, let alone appreciated as an authoritative, authorial evaluation of Susanna's motivation. Sie hätte vielleicht nicht mehr leben mögen, wenn sie erst ihr verlassen sein könnte. And this uh, final uh, sentence is almost the last sentence of the novella, uh, associates even Susanna, this alternative to the modern condition, with 
Martha Volk in the previous novel, uh, the epitome of the modern condition. In spite of her connectedness, her unity with the universe, the modern condition of loneliness and homelessness catches up with her in the significant moment of seeking fulfillment, reunification with her partner, and in the significant location of the railway tracks. It's a consequence of modernity because of this location. In both narratives, different as they might be, dissolution and self-destruction provide a bleak and pessimistic commentary uh, to the questions regarding Jewish and female existence under the conditions of modernity. The isolation and loneliness of the governors and the disillusional radicality of Martha Jadasson create a sense of tragic inevitability which seems magnified and exacerbated by the political situation, but not caused by it. The dissimulatory gesture, frequently identified in Colmar's poetry, and evident in her life as, under even the most difficult circumstances, she learned Hebrew and attempted to compose poetry in this language, uh, so this dissimulatory gesture is completely absent in her prose. Here, the re-familiarization with uncorrupted Jewish culture remains unattainable, and the upper of modernity insoluble.